Amen. All right, so we're in a series now uh, that we've been doing, and this is on the back of last uh, month's um, Heart for the House, where you guys were just so amazing there. And I saw you guys do some really incredible stuff. I saw growth. We fasted together as a church. We did all kinds of, um, I mean, it was really just, it was, it was amazing. And I changed a sermon idea that I had and decided, you know, I, I want to talk about uh, who you are. Because I felt like our church was doing something significant, becoming something significant. Uh, not that we weren't, but something new was happening here. Even on Friday night in our youth, Pastor Kyle said, hey, on Friday something is changing. Something significant is happening with our high school students here. So it's, it's church-wide here. So I wanted to speak to uh, exactly who you are. Now, I want to give you some... I want to give you some inspiration this morning. That's what this is about. Uh, this message is, is here to inspire, inspire you. I don't know what's going on with all of your lives when you leave this building. I, I don't know. But what I can do is I can speak to you in here and I can hopefully speak some inspiration. But I'm going to tell you about an event in the Bible that was absolutely impossible. That should not have happened. And if you've been here for the last couple of months, we've been talking about the impossible, how we think something's impossible, but really it ends up just being unexplainable. And the difference between impossible and unexplainable is God. When you add the God factor in, impossible can become unexplainable. I personally like that. I'm not that smart or that creative. So if I have to come up with the way that God moves or God answers my prayers, then that's pretty limited. That like really limits. And some of you guys aren't even as smart as I am. So it's even, even more limited, okay? You know? <laughs> you guys are all brilliant, I promise. Uh, so that's even more limited. But if I take me out of it and I allow the God factor, then it's, it's unlimited as to what God could do to take impossible unexplainable. So I want you to participate a little bit up here at the beginning. What's going on in life that feels, that feels impossible? Uh, relationally, is there a relationship that you feel like can't be mended? Okay, feel, that feels impossible. Are you in so much financial debt that you feel like getting on the other side of that is impossible? Uh, what about just socioeconomic things going on in life. You know, stuff is expensive. It's getting more and more expensive. And you think, man, it's just impossible for me to get ahead. Uh, what about personal healing? What about, like, your anxiety, your depression? You know, I, hello, I, I've spent a lot of time in my life, you know, laying on the floor, riddled with anxiety, with panic attacks, with a major depressive disorder, just thinking, today is impossible, you know, let alone tomorrow. Tomorrow seems impossible. So I, I, don't know what, I don't know what your impossible is. But what I do know is whatever it is, it isn't actually impossible. Let, let's just go on this journey and see that, it can, that, that the transition from impossible to unexplainable, that, that's what we want to see. We don't want to see it to be, we, we don't want to be able to explain that. So I'm going to take you to... Uh, to the resurrection, all right? So Jesus, he comes, he predicts that he died. He predicted his death, so he dies. Uh, and then he predicts that three days later, he's going to raise, so that's the resurrection. And then he's going to ascend up into heaven, okay? And um, five weeks after the resurrection, we come to a point where Jesus has been seen by over 500 people. So th this is important to get here. It's important because it's, it's unbelievable. I thought that when Jesus died, that he laid in the tomb, you know, looking at his uh, Apple Watch saying, okay, day one, day two, I'm hungry, I'm bored, my back hurts. And then he raises from the dead, you know, rolls the rock away, gets out of the tomb, sees a few people, and then a few days later, he ascends and he goes up to heaven. Gets on an elevator, pushes the button, goes up into heaven, all right? But that's not, that's not actually the way that it happened. When Jesus resurrected, it means like he came back to life after being dead. 500 people saw him. 500 people. That's a, that's a lot of people. 500 people see this guy. That's just, I mean, so right now, I want to bring validity to everything that we say. In fact, I'm going to share Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 3 here. 
This is Luke talking about Jesus. Acts is really a book about you know, the church after the resurrection. It's a book about Jesus, the, the, the way the church was formed after Jesus resurrected. And here, here's the way Luke explains this. Now, by the way, Luke is there, and, and he's a part of this. The people that we're talking about, these 500, they saw Jesus' small room. That's what your pastor thinks about. Is I wonder what that smelled like. You know, you hold, I'm like, I wonder what that smelled like. So remember, I want us to be inspired by this. You think that there's something in life that's impossible. We're going to look at this and it's, I know that it's going to encourage you into thinking just maybe it's not impossible. Because if all this is true and it happened, then who's to say that it can't happen or something amazing can't happen in your life? Because what we're going to read happens here is, is quite incredible and it is quite impossible but yet Jesus he has it happen so this is I love what Luke says here he says that he appears to these men by a series of many infallible proofs that's a great word infallible proofs and unquestionable demonstrations appearing to them over a period of 40 days talking to them about the things concerning the kingdom of God so here Jesus is he's appeared to them but Luke says that it's absolutely infallible proof, that it's absolutely uh, 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 these demonstrations that can't be ignored. There, there's your validity. You know, the resurrection of Jesus is not just uh, a beautiful spiritual idea that we hold on to. It's an event. It's a fact. You know, if you think something's impossible in your life, I would be willing to bet that the guy that predicted his death, died, predicted his resurrection, rose is probably a guy worth believing in to turn the impossible in your life into something that is unexplainable but ends up being possible. That, that's the Jesus that we're talking about here today. So while being together, so he's predicted, or he, he's risen, he's shown himself to, to all these people, he's walked and talked with them for 40 days, and while being together and eating with them, here's why eating is so significant. First of all, food's great. Secondly, if Jesus were a ghost, he wouldn't be able to eat. It would just fall right through, Correct. To take a bite and just hit the floor. But instead, he's eating because he came back in flesh. He came back as man. He didn't come back as spirit, as angel. He didn't come back as ghost. He came back as man, just as he was before he died. So he commands them, gives them instruction. This is uh, Jesus saying, I-, I need you guys to do something here. I need you to not leave Jerusalem. Don't leave Jerusalem. But instead, I want you to wait for what the Father has promised, of which he has said, you have heard me speak. So Jesus is saying, don't leave Jerusalem. See, already right here, Jesus is starting to put the pieces together so that something that should be impossible becomes possible. It's just unexplainable how it happens. It's like a really good movie where, you you know, the plot twist happens and you're like, Oh, and then you go back and you watch it and you see all these clues all the way from the beginning of the movie that you're like, oh, now that's why that happened and that's why that happened and that's why that happened. Okay, now that makes a lot more sense here. And that's what's going on here. They don't know what's about to happen and neither neither do some of us. But here he's saying, okay, I'm with you. Do not leave Jerusalem. I want you to stay right here. And I want you to wait for the Father because he has... You've heard me speak of this. He's promised something for you. So what he wants to give them is something significant. And this is a a key, crucial thing to making the impossible possible. In verse 5, it says, See, John baptized you with water. So many of us know that story. Uh, John was baptizing people, meaning people were coming down and they were saying, I want my life to follow Uh, in the way of this guy you're talking about, in the way of Jesus and his teachings. And so publicly, they came down, and John dunked them in the water, and they came up. And that's that's the baptism with water. But now all of a sudden, uh, Jesus talks about another baptism. And he says, you're going to be baptized and empowered and united with the Holy Spirit not long from now. Now, they They would have known what this meant here. It's easy to glaze over this scripture right here. Okay, so if you go to the Old Testament and you flip through the prophets and you see all the cool stuff that happened. Think about uh, Samson has his hair cut off. 
and he loses all of his superpowers. And then in the final act of his life, he's standing in the temple and he asks God to give him the strength to push over uh, the pillars and just let the Colosseum fall. See, what would happen in the Old Testament? The Holy Spirit would come down and perform something, do a miracle, do something powerful, and then the Holy Spirit would leave. So you've got, you've got God, Jesus hasn't come on earth yet, and the Spirit comes down and does something, and then the Spirit leaves. Then it comes down, and does something, and then the Spirit leaves. In Psalms, David speaks about how his words are coming from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes down, and then it leaves. So when Jesus tells them about this Holy Spirit that's going to come, that's what they're thinking. They're thinking, okay, Elijah, Elisha, Moses, Samson, David, they're thinking all these guys and ladies that they've heard about, they're going to get that power. Something cool is going to happen in their life. And it's going to happen not long from now. Now, when this happens here, uh, Jesus calls them. They're, they're all in the, in the upper room. And inside that upper room, um, they're waiting because they've been called to wait there. They're waiting for this Holy Spirit, for this Holy Spirit to ascend and to drop on them. But before that happens, they come to Jesus before he's resurrected. And before Jesus goes up into heaven, they ask Jesus a question. And they say in, in verse 6 here, this is the last question that they ask Jesus. And I'll tell you about the upper room and what they're waiting on with the Holy Spirit uh, because... This question that they ask is, again, Jesus reinforcing that what you're waiting for in this upper room where you've assembled, the stinky room with 141, 142 people in it, you're going to get this thing. And here, here they ask a question, and Jesus clarifies. So when they had come together, they ask him repeatedly. Moms, don't you love when your kids ask you something repeatedly? Mom, mom, mom. Lord, 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 are you at this time reestablishing the kingdom and restoring it to Israel? Are you, are you going to take, are you going to, they, they think that Jesus is leading like a, a military movement. That Rome is going to fall away and Israel is going to be reestablished. So Jesus is on that holy elevator going up and they're like, Lord, 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 are, are you going to reestablish us? And Jesus says to them, guys, it's not up for you. It's not up for you to know. You don't need to know these things. It's not up for you to know the times which my father is fixed in his own authority. That's kind of like Jesus saying, hey, don't worry about it. All right. You're on a need to know basis. And it turns out you don't actually need to know here. And then he clarifies to him. Remember, this is going to lead us to that to that upper room. But you will receive is the second time that he's told them this. You'll receive power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses to tell people about me. Now, here's to me where the story gets... This is where it gets cool. So that's kind of the scaffolding of how we ended up there. That's how we ended up prepped for this upper room area here. For the Holy Spirit to come down and, and all of that. But here's where the inspiration for me comes in. And as I was studying for this, it just kind of unfolded. And I thought, I, I cannot believe uh, that I haven't seen this before or that I haven't seen it in this way. So in your mind, grab that thing that's impossible. Capture that thing there. And then let's go on a journey where hopefully you'll be inspired here. So Jesus tells them, you're going to get the Holy Spirit. Why are you going to get the Holy Spirit? You're going to get it so that you will be my witness. Now, th this isn't the kind of witness that's like a witness in jail or, or not in jail, but like on trial. Jesus is saying, you're going to be my witness, meaning that people are going to look at you and they're going to see me. They're going to look at you and they're going to see the evidence of my work in you. That, that's what that means. So you're getting the Holy Spirit, the power and the ability that comes with it. But why? The purpose is so that when people see you, they see me. They see Jesus. And I, I think the disciples are like, okay, okay, I can track with that right there. Now, if Jesus gives them the Holy Spirit and tells them to be a witness, then that means that it's possible. So it means that it's, it's doable. And they think, okay, we can do this here. So far, so good. Everything makes sense, you know. We've seen you. We've spent 40 days with you. Five weeks have gone by. We've walked with you. We saw you eat, so we know you're not a ghost. 
You've ascended into heaven. This is, okay, you're about to ascend, in, ascend into heaven here. Final question. So we know that you're real. Now, Jesus now boggles their brain a little bit. And he tells them that you're going to go be a witness in Jerusalem, which is the city that they're, they're in, and in all of Judea, so that's the region that's around them, and Samaria, that's the greater region, and the Jews hated the Samaritans, so they're like, ah, oh, dang it, crud, you know, calling us to Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Now, how on earth would these guys make it to the ends of the earth? All right? I made a joke in the first service, and if you guys don't laugh at it, then you don't get to, uh, then I'm going to be upset. I wasn't going to say you can't go to heaven, but that's bad, all right? I don't mean that at all. Somebody will clip that, and I'll be fired by next week. But here, here's, here's, here's the joke. Okay, we, if, if, okay, so let's say this. I, we were going to have a picnic next Sunday. You guys are so excited about it. Everything's going to be incredible. Everything's going to be amazing. Uh, we've got great food, and it's going to be like over, you know, maybe Greenpoint Park or something. And uh, all of a sudden, last minute, it moves, and it moves to Durbanville. Guess how many people are showing up? Probably zero. Right? So you guys are not, not laughing at that either. The joke is, is that nobody travels in Cape Town, you know? If you live here, your life doesn't, you don't, your life doesn't exist there. Uh, I, don't want to go to, I don't want to go to Newlands Forest or even to, um, uh, or even to Kirstenbosch because of that one robot on the M3 that takes forever to get through. Okay? I could run to Kirstenbosch faster than driving there. We have cars and all of that. And Jesus is telling these guys that are walking around in sandals in the dirt, you're going to go to the ends of the earth. That already, we've now entered impossibility. So now we're in your impossible situation right here. This is the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about this. <laughs> Mighty rush of wind, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, come on, you know. God's like, hurry up, Chris. I'm ready. You know, I'm ready to drop this on you guys, you know. So Jesus has now given them something. They, they just went from possible to impossible. That's basically what's happened here. And, and it was impossible for a bunch of reasons. You know, when, when they went out, if they were to go out to the ends of the world or outside of Jerusalem, people outside of Jerusalem and Judea, they, they weren't Jewish. They didn't have the heritage. And then, you know, in fact, they had this, this, the way that the pagan gods worked out is if you had a household god and then another one was introduced to you, you added it to the shelf. Uh, if you had household gods and you moved geographically, you would just adopt the gods that were in that area. It was very much a, okay, yes, please, I'll take some more. So they could go and say, hey, we want to tell you about Jesus, this guy that resurrected. They'd say, cool, is there something we can put on the shelf with the other gods? There wasn't like an either or. It was a, okay, all inclusive. Even the idea of sin didn't exist because sin requires obedience. And pagan worship and pagan gods, they, they just required sacrifice. So you didn't actually have to be obedient. So how on earth are the disciples going to take a message that is unknown to the world and take it out to the world, walking, by the way, past Durbanville, you know, all the way past Tableview, all the way out to Longabon? How are they going to do that? It just seems impossible. So the question is, is was Jesus asking for the impossible? And I, I think the answer to that is, is yes. It, 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 it truly is impossible. And it is. There, there's things in our, those impossible things that you talked about in your life. And now I know I'm kind of contradicting myself a bit. But they are impossible. Your healing is impossible. Your uh, healing of relationships. You're overcoming the addiction. Hey, that, in your own logic, in your own reasoning, it is impossible. And if you never leave your logic and let the God factor come in... It's always going to stay in the impossible area. All right, so get this. Here's where another level of inspiration comes. Jesus asked them to do something impossible. Go to the ends of the earth and be a witness to me. Not, not possible and happening. So look at what Jesus does, all right? So Jesus has this 
has organized this thing so that the disciples, he tells them to wait in Jerusalem. Why did he tell them to wait in Jerusalem? Because it's about to be uh, the day of Pentecost, which is 50 days after, um, after the resurrection. And that day of Pentecost, it's the second of annual big kind of week-long festivals of, of the harvest. And the day of Pentecost is coming. So Jesus says, I know it's coming, so I want you to stay in Jerusalem. Now what happens on that day, remember Jesus said, Take the, the, be a witness to the ends of the world. What happens for that festival, for that week, is people come from, guess what, all over the world. And they come to Jerusalem. So Jesus says, go do something that is impossible. The disciples think it's impossible. And then instead, he brings everybody to them. Look at, the, look at this map right here. I'm sure none of you can see it from that far away. But if you can't see it, if it's blurry, just imagine. This is the known world here. And all these little hashes and marks and everything on here, it, it represents the Roman Empire and the Parthian Empire. But here's their known world. And people come from all over here, and they come directly to Jerusalem. The disciples didn't have to walk. They didn't have to go. What they thought was impossible, Jesus is orchestrating. He's bringing the pieces together. So if, if, you're, if you're struggling with what you think is undoable, impossible in your life, hey, maybe Jesus is bringing some pieces together. And you just can't see it. You may not be meant to see it. And so here Jesus is bringing the whole world to Jerusalem where he told the disciples to wait because he knew a festival was coming where the whole world would gather. And so he's got the 142 in a room. He's got the whole world that has come down together. They've all obeyed and they've all waited in Jerusalem. And now Jesus is going to move in their lives. And he's going to give them this Holy Spirit that he said that he would give them. And in verse 2 here, uh, if we look at Acts 2, 2 through 4. And suddenly, wouldn't it be cool if a plane went by right now? That would be so cool. Okay, ready? And suddenly a sound came from heaven. Okay, we didn't get lucky on that one. All right. And suddenly a sound came from heaven like a rushing, violent wind. And when that sound came, it, it came to the, to, the, to the upper room where you had these, these 142. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there, apparent, there appeared to them tongues resembling fire, which were being distributed among those people. Okay, so is this, could this be reasoned by human mind? No. So we've now entered the God factor. Now impossible begins to become possible, but will always be unexplainable because the God factor is there. So he calls them together. The Holy Spirit comes like a rushing wind. All the pieces have aligned. So 142 people in the upper room have that experience with the Holy Spirit. And it, it comes and it sits and it's being distributed among them. And it rested on each one of them as each person received the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled. They were filled with it this time. And, and that is that it's diffused throughout their being. So it wasn't that the Holy Spirit came and then left. It was that the Holy Spirit came and it became a part of them. It became uh, diffused in them. It's like it just, you know, filled them. It filled the air around them. But, but the Holy Spirit was there and it was now a part of them. And that happens for a reason. Remember, Jesus is trying to take what they thought impossible and bring it into, through unexplainable things, show them that this is possible. And this is what I hope inspires you. So it diffuses throughout their being with the Holy Spirit. And then here's the purpose. The purpose for this is that they began to speak in other tongues in different languages. So they're not speaking gibberish. Um, you know, nobody is falling out vibrating on the floor. There's not guys in suit coats that are you know, catching people as, you know, as they come forward and, and fall out. The Holy Spirit comes, and the Holy Spirit comes down on them, and they start speaking in tongues, which is actually different languages. And then the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out clearly and appropriately. That's something that oftentimes gets left out. That th th this thing that's happening, this Holy Spirit fire that's ascending on people, it is with purpose. And that purpose is clear and it's appropriate. 
And they're given, uh, they're given the ability to speak languages. Now look at what happens with that ability. It, so <laughs> let me take you back to this here. This all starts with Jesus saying, go be a witness to the ends of the earth. And they think, how is that going to happen? And look at all the pieces that Jesus has orchestrated together. And the Holy Spirit rushed into the room, you know, and it filled the house of God, you know. Look at all the pieces that Jesus has brought together here, that God has ordained in order for this to begin to work and for this to begin to take hold here. They're, they've had, they're, they're now all speaking different languages, and then in verse 7 here, in Acts 2, verse 7, they were completely astonished. So these are those outside the upper room are starting to hear this. They're starting to hear these different languages being spoken. And what they're speaking is the witness to Jesus. They're speaking about Christ. But they're speaking about Christ in people's own language. It wasn't gibberish. It was intentional. It was clear. It had a purpose to it. And this purpose, it, it, it's so that they could... It astonished people, saying, look, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? That means they weren't like the Jewish leaders. See, Galilee was, was far away from Jerusalem. And those, those Galileans had come in, and that's who God was working through. Not, these, not, not the leaders of the temple or the synagogue or, or whatever, but, but through the Galileans. And they say, wait a minute, are, these, are all these who are speaking, are they the Galileans? then how is it that each of us hears in our own language or our own native dialect? How is that possible? How is that happening? See, what God has done here in this moment is God has not only done something in the disciples' lives where those 142 in the upper room have seen what they thought was impossible turn into a reality in a very unexplainable way, but God has also used that to break down the walls, to break down the barriers, the preconceived ideas. I mean, I, I think that a miracle like that would get people's attention. I think, that, uh, I think that those that were maybe skeptical would all of a sudden think, maybe there's something going on here. And I think that those like skeptical tensions here and those expectations kind of fall away, and they fall away for a purpose. I think that God is softening the hearts of the people that are there. So again, God asked the disciples to do the impossible, be a witness to the ends of the earth. And it was impossible by human standards, just like your impossible is impossible by your, by your own thoughts and your own mind. Instead, he brings, he brings the world to the disciples be inspired by this. When you find yourself thinking, there is no way that this is going to work out for my life. There is no way that I can overcome an anxiety or a depression. There is no way that I can get through an addiction. There is no way that I can heal a relationship that is broken. There is no way that I can stop hating my spouse or a friend. There is no way that I can catch up financially. There is no way that I will ever be significant in the eyes of those that are around me. There is no way that I will ever even be significant to myself. When you, when you think no way, I want you to think to this way here. Because Jesus made a way. And he made a way for, for his witness, which is that Jesus loves you. He died for you. He forgave you of your sins. He resurrected. That's the gospel message. That, that's the witness that he wants to take. We sit here today because of this moment here. In this moment, Jesus started and birthed the first century church. And it came out of an absolutely unexplainable event. So... Later, I th probably later that day or the next day, I like to think that, or I, what I've read in research, not what I like to think, but what I've read in research is, is there would be a, a gathering of people, and Peter was going to preach a, a sermon. Uh, it's probably the first sermon here. And Peter's going to preach a sermon, and there's a ton of people around, so speculation is, is that they were in the temple court here. And Peter's got their attention. The walls have been broken down. And then Peter and the disciples, they're, they're emboldened, they're empowered, because they're like, look at, look at what's happening right here. 
Let's seize this opportunity. Let's speak. And God has prepared the hearts of the world that has been brought from the outer edges of the world, brought into Jerusalem. He's prepared their, their hearts. And Peter gets up and he gives, a, he gives a sermon here. And in Acts 22, or Acts 2.22, you guys can read the whole sermon if you want to here. But he's, he's men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus of Nazareth. He begins to recount to them. He says, this is, this is the Jesus that is validated by God. This is the Jesus that came and sacrificed himself for you. And remember, Peter is speaking to a crowd that has just heard in their own tongue and dialect a witness of God, a witness of Christ. And he says, this is the Jesus that you nailed to the cross. This is the Jesus that by your actions, you nailed him to the cross. Peter is now talking about sin. He's telling them that your sin put Jesus on the cross. Same for us. Same for me. My sin put Jesus on the cross. All of us are born with a sinful nature. The most impossible thing that should be impossible, that should never be possible, is that my sin should be forgiven and I would be restored to God. It, it should be impossible that I would be shown mercy and I would be shown grace. Grace is forgiveness of something I don't deserve. Mercy is, is forgiveness of something like a punishment that I do deserve. And I was given grace and I was given mercy by the man that my sin put on the cross. And that's the message that Paul is telling them. When they hear that, they respond in, uh, in verse 37 here. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. That means they were impacted. They were really impacted with remorse and anxiety. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what is it that we are to do? See, I, I, when, I, when I measure the impact of my sin, putting Jesus on the cross, it doesn't, it doesn't always cut me to the heart. It really doesn't. But if you, if you were there and you saw it, it would cut you to the heart. You would be moved. You would be impacted. You would be emotionally impacted. What I, what I hope today is that I hope that God does something in your life, that God uh, shows up, He speaks to you. I hope that He begins to show you that this impossible thing that, that you think is impossible in your life can actually become probable and can become possible through the unexplainable intervention of God. And I hope that that does something significant in your life that cuts you to the heart, meaning it impacts you, it affects you. On July 21st, 1996, I got down on one knee, I gave my life to Jesus. For the next two, maybe three weeks, I don't exactly remember, but I know it was for the next two weeks. Every time I even entertained the thought that I was forgiven, I just, I just cried. I just... I just lost it because I was, I was cut to the heart. I had experienced something that should be impossible. But with the God factor, it became possible. So they ask, brothers, what are we to do? They ask Peter and the other disciples. And then Peter gives them this answer here. And Peter said to them, repent. Easy answer, repent. And that, what that means is change your old way of thinking. Turn from your sinful ways and accept and follow Jesus as the Messiah. So when we do a call to salvation, what I'm asking you guys to do here in, in this room or here at church, when anyone does a call to salvation, is for you to say, okay, I'm sorry. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I repent. And when I repent, that mean, it doesn't mean that I'm never going to sin again. It's like, hey, I'm walking in the direction of sin in my life. I encounter Jesus. Jesus has an impact on my life. I want him in my life because I've seen that he is the answer to my impossibility becoming possible. And so I repent to Jesus and I turn and I walk in the other direction. I'm still going to mess up. I'm still going to make mistakes. But now I'm moving away from my sinful nature, my sinful life, my old choices, my old habits. And now I'm just turning to him. And to put yourself in the shoes of these guys and these women and these men that are there that are hearing Peter's sermon, they, they were alive when Jesus died and resurrected. They've heard people speak in their own language. 
God has gathered the world to this one place in Jerusalem. And he's given Peter a pedestal to speak. The, the barriers are broken down. And that's why they're cut to the heart. And they say, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And he says, repent and then be baptized. And that baptized, it's not repent and six months later be baptized. It's not repent and maybe in two years be baptized. It's repent and be baptized. Those two are coming together. And to be baptized is you showing publicly that I have repented. I'm no longer walking in my way. Now I'm walking in Jesus' way. Even though I'm going to mess up and I'm going to trip and I'm going to fall, I'm at least moving in His, in His direction. Sometimes you're going to look over your shoulder and say, that way it was a lot more fun. That way it was a lot easier. But I'm walking in this way with Jesus here. So you, your baptism, I'm declaring that. Each of you in the name of Jesus Christ, because of the forgiveness of your sins, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So to, you repent and you get the Holy Spirit. That same power, that same ability. Paul says in verse 39, it's a promise. It's not a maybe. It's not a lottery. It's a promise. It's a promise for you. For the promise of the Holy Spirit is for you and your children and for all who are far away including the Gentiles, so the Jews, the non, as what we would call today like the non-Christians, you know, the, the sinners way out there. It's for them as well, as many of the Lord our God calls to Him. So He calls everybody to Himself there. But it's the promise of the Holy Spirit for you and your children. That's you and your children, and your children's children, their children. And guess where that leads? That leads all the way to us. It says, for those who are far away, chronologically, we're really far away from this. But this promise still applies to us. It, it, this isn't an old promise. It applies to us today. And in verse 40 here, Peter, he doesn't give up. He doesn't give up on them. Peter solemnly testified, and he continued to admonish and urge them with many more words. He, he's, he's just, he goes, he's after, he goes and he goes and he goes. It's, I like that because it's not like he said, uh, okay, repent and be baptized. And everyone said, okie dokie. And they just raised their hand and they did it. There was a process there. Peter is giving them this, this message here. And he's, th these words were saying, be saved from the crooked and unjust generation. That's just the sinful generation. Be saved from it. And then let your children and their children and their children build a new generation. That's not crooked. That's not sinful. And look what happens. All because of this. So then those who accepted his message were baptized. And on that day, 3,000 souls were added to the body of believers. Guys, day one was huge. The birth of the church, the first century church as we know it, was huge. And it started all the way back when Jesus told the disciples, be a witness to the ends of the earth. And they thought, how? And now you have 3,000 people on day one that repent and be baptized. And then they are going to go out to the ends of the earth and be a witness of Jesus. I hope that you're inspired to know that your impossibility is not impossible with Jesus. See, what came out of this was uh, uh, th this first century church here is that this thing was, it was outward facing. It was outward facing in that it was for those that didn't know Jesus. And these are values of us here as a, as a church as well. This message is, is for you and it's for those that don't know Jesus. Uh, it was multicultural. It was, it was to the ends of the world. It wasn't just one generation or one culture or one language. That's why everyone spoke these different dialects and languages. It was multiplying. 3,000, that's multiplication. When 3,000 goes out, guess what that is? That's movement. That's momentum. And it all became possible because Jesus orchestrated all these little things in life. And he got the ends of the world together in Jerusalem with the disciples. He dropped the Holy Spirit on them. And forever after that, the church was born and the world would be changed forever. If Jesus can change the world forever, then he can take care of you. And so if you don't know Jesus, if you know Jesus but have been far from him for a long time, 
If you know Jesus and you haven't been far, but you haven't been baptized, I, I want to give you guys today a chance to do that. We're not going to do it in a weird way. We're not going to make you uh, uh, stand up and, and um, you know, put yourself out there. But today is an opportunity for you to repent and be baptized. Now, what I've done, I've gone before you, and I've spent time praying here, praying specifically that there would be no fear in this room and there would be courage, praying that there would be comfort and peace and courage. And so what, what's going to happen is I'm going to lead us in a prayer of salvation, which is basically helping you to say to God, I repent, I want you to be the Lord of my life. And then after that, the band's going to come out and they're going to lead us in some worship. It's not a, it's not a long set because I want you, just, I want you to move. And at this door, and at that door, and at that door in the corner, we're going to have volunteers. And if you have given your life to Christ, or you've done anything with, with if, if you want to know about salvation or repentance, if you want to know about the Holy Spirit, you've had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, if you need prayer for your impossible situation, or if you want to sign up for baptism, hey, if you've given your life to Jesus, this is a no-brainer. You don't have to understand it or figure it out. Let's get you baptized. And if you want that, you can go to this door, that door, or that door. We're going to have a volunteer that's going to open the door, let you step outside in some privacy, and, and we're, going to get some, we're going to get your name. We're going to see how can we help baptism, salvation. But today is the day. This is the greatest thing you can do to take a step. Take a step towards making your impossible possible. So let me lead you guys in a prayer. Close your, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And this prayer is for those that don't know Jesus at all. And 3,000 people came to know Jesus on day one with Paul here because they repented. And so this, this is a prayer of repentance. So let me lead you guys in this prayer. And if this is you, I just want you to say this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, no more running or resisting. I am yours. I'm placing my faith in Christ's death on the cross for my sin, and I thank you for forgiving me. I receive that gift. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my life right now. And with that prayer, we say amen.